Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, before we start, as usual, just a few uh, organizational remarks. Uh, remember, the deadline for the practical assignment is Thursday, 1 o'clock. I haven't put the submit system online yet, but I will do this uh, later today. So it should be uh, online this evening. If not, I'll leave a note when, when it will be online. And then most likely you can upload your stuff starting tomorrow. <clears throat> And uh, also, as some of you probably noticed, we put up a forum now where you can discuss and ask questions related to the practicals. I guess it's not that much critical for the first one because the first assignment was basically just a tutorial, so it should have been pretty easy. But uh, for the second, then you can use you can use it. And um, <clears throat> also, there will be an introduction talk about the practicals, or that gives you a little help for the practicals next Tuesday and yeah this is mostly a remark to the people who are not here now this talk will not be recorded so uh, I recommend that you come here this next Tuesday those of you who are not here yet you of course too <laughs> good um, yeah and the second assignment will then be online on Friday I think Friday morning it should be online and if not, again, then I post a note when it gets delayed, when it will be online. Like I said, we are doing this the first time now, so uh, the practice has changed completely, which is why a lot of things will be kind of last minute for us. Good. Okay, so today we're going to talk about matrices and determinants. So today will be uh, one of those lectures who, that is pretty much uh, pretty heavy on the mathematical side. But uh, for those of you who don't like that, uh, it will get better. But yeah, today you just have to go through it. Um, I will also do it a little bit different than in the book, at least parts of it. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, I recommend, it's always a good idea to, to also read the book, even if I do it a little bit different here, because reading something with, uh, from, from people who have a different perspective on it or do it in a, in a kind of a different way also kind of... Uh, helps you probably understanding it. Good, so we're talking about matrices and determinants today. So let's start with matrices. So the first question is, of course, what, of course, what is a matrix? And the book, I have it here, the book uh, specifies it as a matrix is an array of numeric elements that follow certain arithmetic rules. So we have an array with elements and then we can do something with it, we can do some calculations with it. So for the calculations we'll do that later. So let's just look at first some definitions. So um, array is uh, a matrix is basically defined as an array of numeric elements which we call coefficients. So you see here you have an array with an, with an index or two indices actually, an I and a J. I usually stands for the row, J stands for the column and uh, we have a fixed numbers of rows and a fixed numbers of columns, M and N, and these are usually then called the dimension of the matrix. And the notation is basically, we just write it down here, obviously, as an array, the coefficients, and then we make these large brackets around them. And usually we also denote matrices with an uppercase letter to distinguish them from the coefficients. But of course, different notations exist in different sources, but that's uh, also how the book uses it and how we will use it in the lecture. Good. Uh, yeah, so as I said at the beginning, just a few definitions about kind of like special cases for matrices. And the first special case is a square matrix. A square matrix is basically a matrix where the, row, the number of rows equals the number of columns. So M equals N. So the dimension is M cross M or N cross N. And uh, the second special case is a diagonal matrix, which is a matrix for which all the coefficients that are not in the center are zero. So this lower triangle here and this upper triangle is zero. And the diagonal in between, there is nothing said about it. Then we call it a, di a diagonal matrix. If the values in the diagonal, the AII, are just ones, then we call it an identity matrix. And we will see later why where this name comes from, why we call it an identity matrix. And uh, then the third or the fourth special case is the case where the diagonal are also zeros, then we call it a zero matrix. And I think it should be obvious why, where this name comes from. And we often denote this with a large O or a large zero. Good. 
Um, yeah, so these are, that's the definition of the matrices, but of course we want to do something with those matrices, so we want to do some calculations with it, because later we want to use them, of course, for computer graphics. And the first and probably most simple uh, um, <coughs> operation is addition, and that is defined by we add a matrix A to a matrix B to create a new matrix C by just taking the coefficients of each matrix at a specific position, the specific index IJ, IJ, and then we just add them up to create a new index. And uh, if you think about this with a matrix, so here is an example. So you see here, for example, uh, index, uh, this is 2, 2 is 5 from A, from B, B, from B, 2, 2 is 11, 5 plus 11 is 16. So pretty straightforward. We just take each index at the correlating position and just add them up. Um, but you see here, of course, this only works is if both matrices have the same dimension. So the number of rows and the number of columns in each matrix has to be the same. And also then, of course, the resulting matrix will have the same dimension. Otherwise, it doesn't work because this definition doesn't uh, work out then. Subtraction is pretty much the same. So uh, yeah, just instead of a plus, we have a minus here. So instead of 5 plus 11, we make 5 minus 11, which gives minus 6. And again, the, dimension, the, the conditions we have for when this works or when it is defined are obviously the same. Good. So uh, we have uh, addition and subtraction now. And uh, if you think about this with uh, vectors, so, so graphics uh, matrices are kind of like a more general version of a vector now. And uh, in vectors, we also had different operations. For example, we had scalar multiplication. And the same, we have kind of an equivalent in matrices, which is the multiplication of a matrix with a scalar. And that is defined pretty straightforward quite and quite similar to the vector uh, scalar multiplication with vectors, that we just take the scalar and we take each coefficient of the matrix and multiply it with the scalar. So again, here we have 5, and the scalar is 2. So 5 times 2 is 10 pretty straightforward. And since we have a scalar here, there's no problem with the dimension. So there are no conditions. This is defined for every kind, every matrix. Good. Then, uh, yeah, for the vector, uh, I said in, for the vectors, we also started with, multi with addition, with subtraction and scalar multiplication, and we moved to multiplying vectors. We introduced the dot product and we introduced the cross product. So of course, we're also interested in can we multiply or can we define a multiplication of matrices that is kind of useful or that makes kind of sense? And uh, such a multiplication of two matrices exists and we if define it in a way in a way which looks a little more complicated than, than the, the addition, but it is actually pretty straightforward. If you look, if you really uh, look what, what we do here, uh, so you see here to get a new the coef, uh, one coefficient of the new matrix, we do a sum over the product of two coefficients from the old from the original matrices. And if you look here, what we do here, um, we start with an index running from one to n, which is one of the dimensions. I'll talk later about that. And uh, then you see from the first matrix, we take a i k. So we take i from a specific row because it's the first index. And then we run the second index over k. So that means in the first, in a specific row. So for example, row two, we run from run over the second index. That means we run over the columns. And for b, we do the same, only we start, we take the b's from the second index j. So for example, j is 2. And then we run over the first index, which are the rows. So we run over here. And then we take each corresponding coefficient and multiply them with each other. So we take minus 2 times 0, which is 0. We take 1 times 1, which is 1. We take 8 times 0, which is again 0. We take 4 times 1, which is 4. And then we take the sum over it, which is 5. And that is our new coordinate C22 in this case. So you see it appears at 2, 2. So this is pretty straightforward. You just take a row 
and the corresponding column and then you just multiply each coefficient consequently with each other and that now also illustrates what this index n means and what the conditions are that we need to be fulfilled for the matrices so we can do the matrix multiplication it is namely that the number of columns in the first matrix must match the number of rows in the second matrix because otherwise when we walk through it and try to multiply them with each other we end up having more uh, some left where we don't have a partner so this means uh, this is a condition that has to be fulfilled and that also indicates what dimensions the result matrix will have so we have here this here must be the same so this is our index n here and then the result matrix will of course be m a cross n b so the lines of the first matrix and the column the dimension of the columns of the second or the number of columns of the second matrix that's the dimension of our resulting matrix good and uh, yeah so uh, now we have the, the, multipli the multiplication of two matrices defined and now we can of course see um, what kind of characteristics it has and one characteristic for example is the dis that it is distributive over addition that means if we add two matrices and then multiply it with another one we get the same result as if we multiply the matrix with the first one then the multiply the matrix with the second one and then add them up or if uh, the same in this way if we add two matrices and then multiply it it's the same as if we multiply each individual matrix with this matrix C and then do the addition and we can prove that but I will not do this I will do some other proofs today and uh, yeah you can do this uh, probably it is it will even be uh, a part of the tutorial and if not uh, it's a good exercise for you but I will sh uh, do a few proofs today to show you how to do these kind of proofs good um, the other thing is that matrix multiplication, that, the other thing that we could prove is that matrix multiplication is associative and that means if we do the product of three matrices it doesn't matter if we multiply the first two first and then multiply it with the third one or if we multiply the second with the third one and then multiply the first one so it doesn't matter in which order we do the multiplication unless we do not change the order of the matrices because that would mean that made that it is uh, that would be commutative and commutative and uh, that means uh, and that is not the case for matrix multiplication so matrix multiplication is not commutative and that will be very important later when we use the matrices for graphics because if you apply a matrix to a graphics object or if you apply several matrices you will realize that the order matters and that the order has an influence if you screw it up and that is because matrix multiplication is not commutative and this is something that I will prove you so I have the claim is that AB is not BA and uh, one way to prove this is of course to just give an example where this is not the case and then we have proven the general case that AB is BA is not true which means AB is not BA so um, <coughs> um, the, the most obvious way to see this is of course uh, with an example where the dimensions don't match so if we have for example a matrix A that has a 2 cross 2 dimension and a matrix B that has a, oops, 2 cross C, 3 dimensions then A times B is defined but B multiplied with A is undefined so we cannot even calculate it which of course means that AB cannot be the same as BA because BA doesn't even exist we can also give just a concrete case to do this to to prove this so for example if we have a matrix 1 2 3 4 and then we have another matrix 5 6 7 8 now you might wonder why I'm writing it that weird way and not in a line that is a, a kind of a trick when you write it on paper that way it's kind of quite convenient to write and to do the addition because you have it then or uh, mapped in a in like a like a grid 
way. So you can calculate this entry here by taking this line and this column and then pairwise add the coefficients up and go through it and then you end up 1 times 5 plus 2 times 6 which is 12 plus 5 is 17 and the same for these coordinates here. Now if you do the same with 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, oops, 1, 2, 3, 4, then you end up with here uh, 26 and some other coefficients but I'm not calculating them because it's not important because we only want to show that a, b and b, a are not the same. And we see here the first coefficient is different so the matrices no matter what the other coefficients are the matrices will not be the same so this is uh, it's clear that uh, we have show, we have an example here where this where a b equals b a is not true so we can conclude that in general we cannot say that matrix multiplication is commutative and this is important because uh, not only because of what we have proven but also how i proved it it's important for you to realize that if you want to show that something doesn't work then just giving one example for it is enough to prove it because by one example we can show that the general case doesn't work. If we would like to prove that matrix multiplication for example is associative, just giving one example doesn't isn't enough to prove it because if we show it with one example that it works, it doesn't mean that it works with any other example. So we have to do it in a more general way and I will have an example on how to do this later. Good. So uh, yeah, so I uh, <clears throat> now that we know matrix multiplication, let's look again at these two special cases, the identity and the zero matrix that I defined before. The identity, mat identity matrix I said has zeros in the upper and lower triangle and ones in the diagonal. And we see now with matrix multiplication, if we multiply this with a matrix, A11 and so on, um, then we get A11 as a first entry plus everything else will be zero because there are only zeros so we get a11 here if we do it for the second one we get a22 two two here uh, no a21 here sorry and uh, and so on so you see here based on how this matrix looks like and how we defined matrix multiplication it's obvious that this here will be exactly the same matrix as here. So if we identif uh, multiply the identity matrix with a matrix, the result will always be this matrix A and the same works also A times E. So in this case it is commutative, so the order doesn't matter, but it's not the general case that it is commutative. Uh, commutative, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you see this here, obviously, and this is, of course, why we call it the identity matrix. Because if we multiply a matrix with it, the matrix doesn't change, so it doesn't change its identity. So the identity stays the same. And the zero matrix is, of course, you can see it easily how we because of how we uh, how we define matrix multiplication. If you multiply a matrix with the zero matrix, you will always get zero no matter if you multiply it first or if you multiply the matrix with the zero matrix or the zero matrix with the matrix, you will always end up with the zero matrix. So the zero matrix and the identity matrix are basically the equivalent of the zero and the one in normal scalar multiplication because if you multiply a value with one, it doesn't change the value same way if you multiply a matrix with the identity matrix, it doesn't change the matrix. Good. Um, another special kind of matrix is the so-called transpose of the matrix. And the transpose of a matrix is created by the matrix by just switching the indices basically. So if we have, so every index AI becomes the index A, AIJ becomes the index AJI. So for example, if we have a12 here, then in the transposed this is A21. And of course also vice versa, A21 becomes A12. And as a consequence, if you think of that this, of course, it will also result in a switch of the of the uh 
dimension. So if the original ma uh, matrix is an M cross M matrix, then the resulting, the transpose of it as the dimension M cross N because we're just exchanging the uh, coefficients. Good, yeah, so this is an example. I mean, it's it's so simple that you don't need to have an, uh, uh, that uh, it's, you, you would understand this without an example, but I included it here to, uh, to illustrate again how the dimensions uh, change, of course. Good. Um, yeah, and one characteristic of the transpose matrix is the so-called transpose of the product of two matrices. If we do the product of two matrices and then build the transpose, we get the same result as if we take the transpose of both matrices individually and then do a multiplication, but in the other order. So A multiplied with B and then build the transpose is the same as the transpose of B multiplied with the transpose of A. And this is now a thing that I want to prove you. And here we cannot prove it by just showing one example. Here we have to prove it in a general way. So what we do is we write down the matrices in a general way that we say we just choose random uh, dimensions or we leave the, cur the actual value of the dimension open. We calculate it for the general case with M, A, N, A, M, B, N, B, and uh, wait, just wondering. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there something wrong with the indices here? Ah, oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Now and I, I, I was confused because uh, because of this, but of course uh, we, we do the multiplication. So the line index of B must be the line the the column index of A, which is why I have chosen N A here. So uh, N M B. I was confused because that was missing here. M B is N A. So that's why. Okay. Good. Yeah. So you see, this is for one of the, the things with these kind of proofs that you often get pretty easily confused, like I did now. Okay. But it looks like it's correct. So we have a general matrix A and we have a general representation of the matrix B. So let's, and we want to prove this here. So let's look at the left side first. Let's look what we have when we want to calculate A, a multiplied with B. We get a new matrix C. And for each coefficient, so for each random coefficient in that matrix C, I, J, we get, we can build it, calculate it the following way that we take the row, a row with the index I and the coefficients from the column with the index J, multiply them with each other and then take the sum. So this is straightforward, the definition of matrix multiplication. And we can do, the, so for each index I, J, within i and b so i runs over the ro or the rows of a and j runs over the columns of b and that way we can create this new matrix a b now let's look at the right side let's look at b transpose and n transpose so this is b transpose so it's basically just the opposite uh, the, the flipped over version of b so i b i j becomes oops uh, ends up here and the same for a so you see this line i becomes now the column i so this is b transpose and a transpose and if we build the product of them we get a new matrix i call it d here and the coefficient of each matrix d j i is b1 j a1 a i 1 plus and so on. So this is just again straightforward the definition of matrix multiplication for each coefficient in the resulting matrix. And now we want to prove of course that this here C transposed is the same as B transposed A transposed. So if we build the transposed then this means C i j gets C j i in a b 
transposed and that is if you look at what it is now and compare it with this here this is exactly the same only that we have a different order here which we can change because this is just a simple multiplication of two scalars and we know that the order doesn't matter for scalars, it matters for, for matrices but not for scalars. So we see here that this is exactly the same and since we have shown this or since we did not use any specific example or specific in the, uh, value here, we've shown it for all the general cases, we can conclude that it works for all the cases. So for each example that we would choose, we would be able to get, we will get the same result. There will not be one single example where we can get it. And this is important, of course, I, I ditched the proof not because this statement here is so important, but to show you the difference between making a proof of a general case and the difference between making a proof that uh, something doesn't work where you can just show one example and then you have proven that it doesn't work and I, I want to highlight this because it happens so often that in the exam people they just write down three examples to show that something works and then they conclude yeah it always works and that gives you zero points because it's just not giving an example to show that something a general case works is just not uh, how you can prove it Good. Um, yeah, so I already said at the beginning that matrices are kind of quite uh, similar or there is a lot of relation between vectors and matrices because it's basically just uh, generalization to, to uh, more dimensions. And indeed, it turns out that the vector uh, scheme or the, the vector framework that we introduced earlier fits very well into this matrix multiplications uh, into this matrix framework so we can basically put the two things together and do matrix multiplications with vectors and we will do this a lot in the next lecture but for now for example just look at the dot product that we have if we have two vectors and build the dot product if we write the vector, the first vector, as it's transposed. And you remember when I talked about the different vector notations, I already introduced that by just writing it down and not telling you that this T stands for transposed. But I already did this and you see here that this is, here we have the commas, here we don't have the commas, that's why we have the T here. And now you see why I use the T here, because if we write this vector as it's transposed, then the, scale, the dot product becomes exactly matrix multiplication. So this is one example, but you will see later then that we can include vectors in this matrix uh, multiplication by just saying uh, a vector is basically the same as an uh, n cross 1 matrix. And as I said, next lecture we will see a lot of examples where we take advantage of this because we will use matrices to manipulate vectors. Good. Um, yeah. Now a final uh, special case that we have for matrices is the so-called inverse of a matrix and the inverse of a matrix is a matrix that has the characteristic if you multiply it with the original matrix either you multiply the original matrix with the inverse matrix or you in multiply the inverse matrix with the original matrix you will always end up with the identity matrix. So this is basically like for, for scalar multiplication, it's just the, the inverse. So if you have like three times one divided by three, then you end up with one. And the same for matrix multiplication. If you multiply a matrix with its inverse, you end up getting the identity matrix. And we see here that only square matrices uh, can have an inverse and it says possibly have an inverse and that kind of implies that the inverse of a matrix does not always exist so we cannot always create a matrix that we can multiply with another one to get uh, the identity matrix and uh, we will see later how we can calculate them and then we will see that it is indeed not always possible to calculate the inverse matrix and in the next lecture we'll see why inverse matrices are so important. They are very important if we want to do translation of objects with matrices, but later, yeah. 
Good. Yeah. So I warned you today will be uh, pretty much heavy on the mathematics, but uh, yeah, we will make more relations to graphics than later. And a few relations actually already uh, will be done today. And one of them is uh, exactly the next step, which is linear equation systems. So it's linear equation systems are used a lot in various fields. Um, and I will show you later why they are important also in graphics. But for now, just the definition of a linear equation system. A linear equation system is basically um, you have linear equations. That means you have a couple of constants and a couple of variables. And the variables, so these are the constants. And these here are... The variables and since the variables are all to the power of one so there is no x1 to the power of two or three since they are all to the power of one they are lin uh, we call it a linear equation system and we have a number of these equations m equations and that's why we call it a system and not just a equation or you could also call it a set of linear equations but the term system is generally used or LES linear equation system and uh, of course uh, depending on, on what we use this for what we want to know is what is the solution of this so what are the values possible values for x for the xi that fulfill not one but all of these equations that so we say what are the values that solve this equation system and the relation to matrix, matrices now is that we can we can also write this as uh, in matrix notation because if you look at how we defined matrix multiplication then you see that this here ax equals b with a matrix a that contains all the uh, the a's here as coefficients and b as a vector here all the, the the results here be form a vector and all the variables form a vector then we can write this in matrix notation and this is exactly the same as we have here if we do the matrix multiplication here and you see obviously it's convenient because we kind of group the coefficients here the, the constants from the left side in this matrix we group the constants from the right side in this vector and we have all the variables in another vector good and uh, yeah okay so now that's a linear equation system, but of course the question is what, what uh, has this to do with graphics or why are we interested in graphics in linear equation system or in solving linear equation system? Now if you look at this example here, what does this uh, remind you of? Yeah? Hmm? Three uh, lines? Almost correct, yeah. It's uh, three coordinates, so we're in 3D. So it's, uh, it's uh, planes, yeah but you're, you're uh, on the right track. So this is, if you, if you don't see it, make it, write it like this, minus equals zero. And this is exactly the implicit representation of three planes in R3. And now a question, what would be the geometric interpretation of a solution of this linear equation system? So uh, X, Y, and Z values that fulfill all these equations. dot yeah and what what's what's special about this dot yeah he said it it's on all three of the planes it's basically the intersection of the planes exactly so each all points that fulfill this linear equation system are exactly all points where the three planes intersect Good. So by solving this, we can calculate the intersection. And the good news is that there is a rather simple way to do this, which is called Gaussian elimination. And uh, yeah, it says here that we don't need matrices to do Gaussian elimination, but matrices are a very convenient way to represent Gaussian elimination. And for Gaussian elimination, we use so-called augmented matrices. And... Um, so, uh, uh, and, and an augmented matrix is basically defined as we just take the constant values from the, from the linear equation system. So we take the A's and the B's, and then we have a line here to indicate where the coefficient, where the A's are, where the left and where the right side of the equation system is. But it's basically just a large matrix that combines all the constant values. Good. And then the, the basic idea of the Gaussian elimination is 
basically that we do some operations with this matrix that doesn't change the result, but turns the matrix into a form that makes it very easy to see the result, uh, to, to read what uh, what to to see what the result of for this x y and z is, and um, so let's first look into what 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 are these kind of operations that do not change the result. The first operation operation is changing two rows. So if we look at this example again, of course, if we say we write these linear equations in a different order, it will not change the result. It's obvious because we, we just randomly wrote them there, so there is no point in why we cannot change the order. The second rule is if we multiply a row with a non-zero constant, it also doesn't change. Uh, or we are allowed to multiply a row with a non-zero constant, and we are allowed to do that because, again, it doesn't change the result. Because if you think, see here, for example, if we multiply this here with some value a that is not zero, you will get the same result as before. Now I, I should have written it differently. Should remove this again. Then it's easier to see. Ah that not that should stay. Alright, so if we multiply this for example with a constant A, you see it doesn't change because we multiply each side equally, so the solution that we get for x, y, and z will not change depending on that. And similarly if we add the multiple oops of another row to a row, it will also not change. So for example, if we multiply this here with b and then we add it to this row here, it will not change because we multiply something that is, because we have uh, an equation here, so the, the, the overall value of what we have on the left side and the overall value that we have on the right side is the same, even if we multiply both sides with b, and even if we add it to here, for this uh, equation, it will stay the same because on each side we add the same value because the other is also an equation. So these three operations do not change our result, so we can do them. And the trick now is, of course, to do them in a clever way that makes the turns the matrix into a form that makes it very easy to see the result. And what would that form be? That form would be something like this. So we see here, we have here, we apply in this example, we apply all these rules or these uh, operations. We start with this here. This is exactly the, uh, the augmented matrix for this equations, uh, li uh, for this uh, equ linear equation system. So this is our AXB. And we do now transformations that do not change the result for X. So we end up with a different matrix A dash X equals b dash, but so the matrix and the result vector are different, but the result is not different because all these operations that we do in between do not change it. And if we look at this result, if you add the variables x, y, and z here, you see that this is obviously, we can immediately see what the result is. The result is x is 3, y is 4, and set is 5. So by turning this matrix A into the identity matrix, we can immediately see the result. And we can do this, turn it very easily into this by applying just these simple rules, which, as I said, do not change the result. So let's just uh, look at this one example. <coughs> it's very simple, but it's, uh, it's good to do it a few times to get a feeling for it. So we want to have, for example, the first row uh, the first column 1 and zeros, but if we look we see that these two are not zero, so we have, we can apply the rule number 3. Which is, we multiply the first row with uh, minus 2 and add it to the second row, then we get here minus 2 plus 2 is 0, minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1, and so on. And then we take the first row, multiply it with minus 1, and add it to the last row, and then we get one minus 1 plus 1 is 0, minus 1 plus 2 is 1, and so on. So you see you get that row, and then you see here that in the first row, we are in the first column, we are done. We have exactly what we want to have here. Now let's move on to the next one because we see here that this 
is not correct. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I looked at the wrong one column. Yeah. So this is a uh, is a one. So we need to, but uh, this is a minus one. But we want to have a one. So we apply rule number two here. We multiply this line with minus one, and then we get here one, three, and nineteen. So just plus here. Okay, and then we're correct here. And then, of course, we see we have the ones here, but we want to have zeros here. So what we do is we basically just apply uh, this with minus, multiply it with minus one, and then add it up here. So we apply again rule number three. So we see our second column is correct. And for the third one, we also have to uh, then do, uh, wait, why am I here? Here, we multiply this with minus one half, so we get the one here, but then these values are not correct, so we have to multiply this here again, and you will figure out yourself what factor we need here. So we again apply rule number three. So you see, by all these simple operations, we end up having the identity matrix. And then, as I said, we can easily see x, y, and z are the uh, is the result. And you already said it when I asked what is the, the idea of it. It's a point and this is exactly the intersection point. Of the three of the three planes. So this is our intersection point indicated by the vector p. Good. So, um, of course, but um, one, one question that can come now is, uh, and that's why when you said point and uh, someone else said intersection, I basically uh, also said intersection and not repeated point, because the question is, of course, does it always have to be a point or can it like be two points, three points or more points? So if we want to have a geometric interpretation of it, we have to look at the uh, how many solutions can we get when we intersect three planes. So let's first look at the intersection of two planes. If we have two planes, we can have an infinite number of intersection points because the two planes can be identical. That is here, so we don't only see one plane because both of them are identical, so they are lying on top of each other or they are identical, then they can be parallel, then we have no intersection point, or they can be somehow twisted, so not be parallel and also not identical, then the intersection will always be a line. So we have, again, an infinite number, but in this case, the infinite number is a plane, and here the infinite number of solutions is a line. Now, if we do a third, put in a third uh, plane, and want to see what the intersection points are, we can we can uh, if we uh, let's first look at at this this situation here. So we have two identical planes, and then we do an intersection with the third one. And then of course that is exactly these two situations that happen here. The solution can be that the third one is parallel to the first two. Then we have zero points, or the third one intersects with the first two in a plane, or the third one is exactly identical as the two already identical planes. So these three solutions here, actually one of them is not, forgot to draw that. So that is the other solution here, which is basically this case here on the right, um, where you have two identical planes and the third one intersects in a line all three are identical or two are identical and the third one is parallel to it. So in that case we have an infinite number of solutions, again a plane, in that case we have zero solutions and here also have infinite number of solutions but a line and not a plane. Now if we look into this case here then we end up in this uh, these two cases here, so two of them are parallel, then the third one can also be parallel, then we have zero solutions, or the third one is not 
if the third one can be identical with one of them, then we have this case here, or it can intersect with one of them, then it also intersects with the other one because that is parallel, but the intersection points don't intersect. So again, we have no intersection points. The solution set of the intersection that we calculate is empty. Then we have this case here. And in this case, we can have also zero solutions, which is this case here, that the line intersects with both of them, but all three intersection lines are parallel to each other, so they have no common intersection points, so we have zero solutions here. The third one can go directly through the intersection line. That means we have an infinite number of solutions, which is in this case a line, and not a plane like here, so it's a line like here. And of course we have the third case where the third one intersects with this intersection line, but not with the whole line, but only with one particular point. So then we have one solution, and this is exactly the case that we had here in our linear equation system. So the question now is what happens with the other cases when we do we present them as a linear equation system, or if we look at it from, from arithmetics, from the Gaussian elimination, what happens when we use this linear equation system and we cannot reduce it to this triangular form where we have the identity matrix on the left? Can we always do that? And if not, what happens with, when we do that? And there are three cases that can happen. First, we can get a line where we have all the variables with zero, and we have a B value that is unequal to zero, and that is... Uh, is uh, that cannot be solved, so there is no solution, and that from a geometrical point of view means there is no intersection. And these are exactly just cases here in the first line. The second thing that can happen is that we get one line where we have all the variables have a factor zero, and that equals to zero, so that is always correct, so we basically end up having one equation less. So we have three variables, but only two, param two equations to solve them. And that means we cannot specify each parameter individually. The best we can do is represent one parameter depending on the other. And that is exactly what specifies a line. So we get something y depends on some values, some function values of x, and that is a line. And that is exactly all the cases we have in the second row here. And the third one is that we get two lines, that we get two lines like this, and then we have um, three parameters and only one equation, so we can express one as a function of the other two, and that can be used to describe a plane. And that is this case here. I said this is the second row that was up, oh, sorry. I said this here, the second case is the second row. That was of course wrong because this here is not true. It's a plane is this here, and this here is then a plane. Good. So um so we see now the relation between the, the arithmetic and the matrices and the computer graphics, why this is very convenient in computer graphics. And there are, uh, there are other, other things which we'll learn later. Um, just a comment in the literature, if you look up Gaussian illumination, you sometimes found a slightly different approach where they basically, uh, it's, it's called a forward and backward approach. So you have a forward step where you basically try to make, uh, where you only make zeros in the lower area, but you do not care about the values in the diagonal. And then you have a backward step where you get all the ones here, starting from the bottom. And uh, so it basically leads to the same thing. It just applies the rule in a slightly different way. Um, so don't be confused if you read that. Or if you're already familiar with that, uh, make yourself clear that this leads to the same thing. I mean, the key point here, the, the trick why this works is basically that when you start from the left to the right and you pull, fulfill in the zeros here, then you can do all the operations here in the end 
they don't change the zeros that you already fixed at the beginning here because you will only add and multiply lines and adding a zero or multiplying something uh, a zero, multiplying a zero with something doesn't doesn't change the value good so this is pretty straightforward uh, another interesting note is that we can also use Gaussian elimination to calculate the inverse of a matrix and this is pretty straightforward uh, application of it you just need to know how you write it down at the beginning which is why I'm not doing it here because it will be just just the same boring uh, going through the procedure again um, so I will do this uh, in the tutorial so we get an exercise about that in the tutorial and then we'll also be able to use Gaussian elimination to create inverse matrices good um, yeah a lot of mathematics so I think we're all ready for a break now <laughs>